through BDS, the Palestinians have actually been successful in changing the Israeli propaganda machine. When people want to speak about Palestine in Europe, they're immediately addressed as anti-Semite. Germany is very complicit and not willing to listen to the Palestinians. We live in a post-fascist Germany, not in an anti-fascist Germany. No state in this whole world has a right to exist. People have the right to exist. Europe has been undergoing massive changes in recent years. As more EU countries see a rise in nationalism and far-right movements, there have been increasing reports of anti-Semitism in the media. Anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism. 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 My name is Dan Glass and I'm an activist for social justice. All four of my grandparents were Nazi Holocaust survivors and I've learned from day dot that Jews were massacred, bludgeoned and forced from their homes. But over the past few years, criticism of Israel and solidarity with Palestine has also been labelled as anti-Semitism. Nous ne céderons rien à l'antisionisme, car il est la forme réinventée de l'antisémitisme. But is criticizing the policies of Israel anti-Semitic? And what lies behind the movement of the so-called new face of anti-Semitism? I'm here because I want to explore where the racism ends and the instrumentalization begins. I'm on my way to Munich to meet Nurit Sommerfeld, a Jewish-Israeli singer who criticised the politics of her own state and found herself amongst accusations of anti-Semitism. Here's the song I wrote. Here. Yeah, Alles Schein. Mm. Alles Schein means uh, what is Cam. So I'm talking to Israel in this song as if it was my lover. The beginning is I, I, I need to go, I need to flee from this place because everything I see weapons and, uh, and violence and I can't stand it anymore. Then in the bridge uh, I'm talking about uh, you are um, torturing people, you are killing children, even your own kids are suffering and so on. And for this line I was accused to serve anti-Semitic um, stereotypes. Because of my very radical views on Israel and Palestine, they won't let me perform. Yeah. And this really hurts. It sounds radical that I say a Palestinian should have the same right as an Israeli. They have the power to give me a hard life. And that's not fair. Yeah. Nirit's experience is not an isolated case. All around the world, solidarity with Palestine and support of the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, or BDS, are commonly accused of being anti-Semitic. And such allegations have caused people to feel increasingly afraid to speak out against Israeli policies. In 2019, the director of Berlin's Jewish Museum was forced to resign from his occupation after tweeting a recommendation to read an article on BDS. A Human Rights Watch official was deported by the Israeli authorities over his alleged support of the boycott of Israel. Every single day, virtually, Israeli and Palestinian human rights defenders are maligned. And those that get it the worst are Palestinian advocates. So what exactly is so wrong about BDS? I'm about to speak to the European Legal Support Centre's coordinator, Giovanni Vecina, who's in Amsterdam, so we're going to have a chat on Skype. This movement was born as a result of the Palestinian Civil Society call in 2005 for boycott, divest and sanction Israel in order to raise awareness among the public about the situation and, both, and also to make an economic pressure on this apartheid regime until the uh, Israel government complies with international law and uh, uh, universal principle of human rights. BDS do not call for the boycott of individuals, groups or entities on the mere basis of their Israeli identity or Jewish faith. They address individual institutions that are specifically affiliated or complicit in Israel violation and great breach of international law. To understand the need for a movement like BDS, one must understand the history of how Israel came to exist. At the end of World War I, the British took over Palestine, and as more Jews emigrated to flee persecution in Europe, tensions increased between local Arabs and Zionists who believed that the land belonged to the Jewish people by birthright. 
1947, after the horrors of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, the UN agreed on a proposal to divide the land into a Jewish state, Israel, and a Palestinian state, with Jerusalem remaining a multi-faith international zone. Even though Jews represented only a third of the population, they were to receive 56% of the land. The neighboring countries didn't accept the plan and declared war on Israel in 1948. Israel won the war in part thanks to a Zionist militia that had received established training from senior British army officer Order Wingate. In the process, the newly proclaimed country expanded way beyond the borders established by the UN and at least 700,000 Palestinians were forced to flee from their homes. When the Six Day War broke out with the surrounding state in 1967, Israel expanded their borders further, with the West Bank and Gaza coming under Israeli occupation. The occupation in the West Bank continues today, and the Israeli government is deeply entrenched in a process of building illegal Jewish settlements in the region, while continuing to subject Palestinians to military occupation, land dispossession and unequal rights. This is the current situation today, a growing vanishing of Palestinian land to Israelis. I grew up in the first Intifada. I have three sisters. We had to leave outside because we had no future uh, in Palestine. Majed Abu Salama is an award-winning human rights defender who grew up in Gaza before moving to Germany in 2016. What we live in is a continuous uh, genocide. Our niece is uh, now have to get used and learn what the bomb mean, what the... She's one year old. Yeah, 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 she's one year. One year and a couple of months now, and, and she had to get used to learn that this, there is a war, there is an explosion, there is a, there is a bomb. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free! Germany is very complicit and not willing to listen to the Palestinians who are not speaking the, the German discourse. The good Palestinian for Germans or the, the Palestinian who don't endorse BDS? In 2019, Germany passed a motion labeling the BDS movement as anti-Semitic. A few months later, the motion was referenced in the deportation document of Khaled Barakat, a Palestinian activist who was expelled from Germany for advocating against the Israeli occupation. They say, for example, that you call for the right of return for Palestinian refugees to their homes. So, what's the crime? They want to silence Palestinians. And so the, the way that Israel is doing this is by asking their allies like Germany, US, Canada, France to uh, oppress movements like the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. In 2017, Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs set aside a budget of 72 million US dollars to fight the global movement, money that was partly used in lobbying activities or public campaigns comparing BDS supporters to Nazis. Right now, most of the times when people want to speak about Palestine in Europe, they're immediately addressed as anti-Semite. Actually, in the recent years, we witnessed the adoption of political resolution which conflates anti-Semitism with legitimate critics to, to the Israeli government. In December 2019, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced plans for a new law criminalising the BDS movement. Israel's Minister of Foreign Affairs even publicly praised the Czech Parliament's decision to condemn the movement. Well, this is the European Parliament. I guess this is where the magic happens, eh? Thomas Sandel is the director of the European Coalition for Israel, a Judeo-Christian lobby that works to deepen relations between Europe and Israel. Thank nice you. to meet you. Really nice appreciate you. your time. Well, my, my, my pleasure. When I hear people in Europe say, don't buy from the Jews, kauf nicht von Juden, that rings, that rings a bell. I heard that before. But what does BDS say? Does BDS say don't buy Israeli products or don't buy products from Jews? Big difference. They say 
let's boycott goods from the only Jewish state in the world today. It has a name, Israel. Is it boycotting Israeli products? Is, does it say that? Or does it say we boycott Jewish people's products? I'm sure if they're smart enough and they have, they have the money and they have the funds and they have the PR people to be able to phrase things in a way that they can but get you, away you, with it. You can't tell me what it says. Uh, what, what the B... Oh, it, it, of course, Israel. Israel, Israel, Israel. Okay. Yeah. That's very different. And it's good to get that clarity. Yeah. So only if you believe that the state of Israel represents all Jews, if you forget the fact that many of the citizens of Israel are not Jews, that most of the world Jews don't live in Israel, if you forget all these facts, then you could say, oh, well, maybe criticism of the state of Israel is a kind of hidden form of, of anti-Semitism. Dr. Shir Hever is a Jewish political economist whose study widely focused on the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian land. Politicians are supporting those declarations without knowing anything about BDS, just because they get some pressure from the Israeli government and they say, oh, well, we can get better relationship with the Israeli government if we speak against BDS, and if we do the opposite, if we speak in favor of BDS, what can the Palestinians give us? Well, nothing. So why, why bother? Today I'm investigating this really interesting organization called RIAS. RIAS is the organization in Germany whose remit is collecting data on incidents associated with anti-Semitism. They had recorded 1,083 anti-Semitic incidents in Berlin in 2018. Now that's a 14% rise in the previous year. That's huge. They go on to say, and this is where it becomes particularly poignant, incidents attributable to anti-Israel activism are the second largest classifiable group. For anti-Israel activism, Rias Berlin includes, for example, secular Palestinian groups and activists who support anti-Semitic boycott campaigns against the Jewish state of Israel. So essentially, they are equating challenging or critiquing the state of Israel with anti-Semitism, which has huge repercussions. If we deducted the 101 incidents related to anti-Israel activism, the total number of anti-Semitic incidents in Berlin would come to 982 in 2018. Whilst this is still a 4% increase from the previous year, it's far from the figures reported by Rias. We contacted Rias numerous times, but they refused and seemed anxious to talk to us, so I decided to call them up directly. Hello, is this Rias? Yes, yes, you are talking to Rias. Yes. I'm in, I'm from London, but I'm in Berlin, and I'm in a cafe, and I heard, overheard the people at the table next to me talking about Palestine and the boycott Israel movement, the BDS movement. It, is that an, is that an anti-Semitic incident? We consider um, the public call for boycotting Israel as an anti-Semitic um, statement. I mean, if you could hear it. Yeah. then it is something that uh, we have to consider to be like a public talk. Uh, reporting to us is definitely something we will uh, consider and examine very well. Thank you. You have a good day. I'll do that as soon as possible. Wow. Wow. So that was Rias. I finally got through to them. He said that it could be considered anti-Semitic. Um, just overhearing... A conversation so that means when people just talk publicly to themselves in a cafe that could be anti-semitic aside from conflating the boycott of israel with anti-semitism post-war germany has a long history of linking support for jewish people directly with the state of israel who are um israel's most staunchest defendants and dependable allies uh, specifically in germany the biggest uh, and most influential group is actually the uh, Protestant church. This is a church that has turned the state of Israel into a theological tool for dealing with its own guilt over its collaboration with the Nazis in the Second World War. And instead of really dealing with the issue of Jews and uh, responsibility towards protecting Jews from hatred and racism, they have transferred that to protecting the state of Israel. They uh, ban events criticizing the state of Israel in public halls. And because the Protestant church in Germany is so powerful and has so much money and so many buildings, uh, they do have the ability to silence free speech on Palestine. Some evangelical Christians 
believe that the modern state of Israel is in accordance with a 4,000-year-old biblical prophecy. The land would be predestined to all Jews, who will rule it until the return of the Messiah, when Jesus returns to Jerusalem. This perspective gave birth to a growing number of Christian Zionist lobby groups around the world. And while these lobby groups are most powerful in the US, they also reach the heart of European politics. I mean, your website, you know, it's, I'm glad you brought that up because it says that ECI believes that Judeo-Christian tradition shapes the ethical codes of Western democratic societies and remains central to our set of values today. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, but where's everyone else? What makes Europe Europe? If we look at the, the um, Convention for International Human Rights and, and, and Fundamental Freedoms, yeah. you know, where do they come from? Where do they find their root? There are few today that would, um, would deny that to say that this is not a product of a Judeo-Christian culture. The argument of the exclusive influence of Judeo-Christians in the shaping of Western Europe denies and even contradicts the influence of Muslims in the region. Today, the term is adopted by right-wing populists like Marine Le Pen and Geert Wilders, who also promote Islamophobic ideas. What does anti-Semitism in the West look like today? I think the statistics has been quite, quite clear in saying that, you know, this would come from jihadistic uh, communities, stereotypes that they are bringing from their, their uh, uh, countries in the Middle East, which are very problematic. Not the far right? Not, not the far right statistically. In fact, the majority of contemporary anti-Semitism is attributed to the white nationalist far right. Germany's federal government found that the number of anti-Semitic hate crimes recorded skyrocketed between 2015 and 2018, and over 89% of these crimes were perpetrated by right-wing extremists. Simultaneously, the latest Global Terrorism Index reported that between 2013 and 2018, Western Europe, North America and Oceania has seen an increase of 320% in attacks committed by far-right terrorists, the same ideology responsible for the staggering rise of Islamophobia around Europe. And there is a huge scene of, uh, of uh, like media and art and cultures and all of it which focused on Muslims and Arab being anti-Semite, you know, and being different and being not part of here. And it's so Orientalist how they look at how the, the, and it's so racist. So we are here in Reuterstrasse, in Neukern, an important Arab and Turkish community because in 2018, a German journalist called Madeleine Haba tweeted, you can't walk down Reuterstrasse in a kippah without massive police protection. So we are here to see if that's the case. So here I have got my Palestinian solidarity scarf. We won't be using that today. My kafirs. This is what I was looking for. This is my kippah, which my German granddad gave to me. I feel like a Jewish polar bear, which is always interesting. We haven't yet found any anti-Semitic reactions, but who knows what may be around the corner. Hey. Aha. Uh -huh. Great. Good. This is good. I agree with that so much. Because can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. I'm Jewish, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I agree, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from London. I'm from London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was told there was this. Ger Sorry, my Germans. You, my cousin Ali. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, good on you. Good on you. I have now been walking around here in Neukölln wearing a kippa and a Star of David. The only interaction I've had is from one fella who had a free Palestine ban, said, where are you from? I said, I'm Jewish. He said, you're my cousin. This is in stark contrast to what Madeleine Arba said, that you need massive police protection. Of course, I'm not denying that anti-Semitic attacks are happening, but we've got to really look at the reality before anti-Semitism just gets thrown up by anyone with their own agenda. The media plays an ongoing role in singling out the Muslim community. 
An American study found that between 2011 and 2015, terror attacks committed by Muslims received five times as much media coverage as those carried out by non-Muslims. And this Islamophobic discourse is no different in Germany, where the Muslim population has become a convenient scapegoat that has been utilised for the far right's gains. Hey, Dan. Hi. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. How are you doing? Wir dürfen nicht vergessen, wir leben in einem postfaschistischen Deutschland, nicht in einem antifaschistischen Deutschland. Susan Wittstahl is a journalist and author whose research has focused on Germany's relationship with Israel since the 1950s. Wir erleben immer wieder, dass die Palästinenser als unzivilisiertes Kollektiv dargestellt wird, als ein Kollektiv, das man zivilisieren muss, also sprich kolonisieren muss, was auch noch sehr interessant ist, das nenne ich Entsorgung der deutschen Vergangenheit. Man versucht, alle Eigenschaften, die der deutsche Faschismus hatte und hat, auf die Palästinenser zu projizieren. There were uh, atrocities and massacres and the Holocaust against the Jewish people in Germany. That's a fact. But they take this fact and they combine it with a big lie. And the responsible parties on the Holocaust in Germany are not the Palestinians, and not the Arabs, and, and not the, the Muslims. They're trying to transfer this responsibility to other people's shoulders and say, when you talk about anti-Semitic, don't look at the new Nazi and the fascist and these uh, criminal parties in Germany, look at Palestinians and Arabs. That is an oft die Schnittstelle zur extremen Rechten in Deutschland. Die extreme Rechte tut nichts anderes, das tut sie seit, seit 1945. Sie versucht die Schuld für die deutschen Verbrechen anderen anzulasten. Wir müssen tatsächlich in die 50er Jahre zurückgehen, als es das sogenannte Wiedergutmachungsabkommen mit Israel gab. Deutschland wollte die Einbindung in den westlichen Imperialismus. Der, der Protagonist dieser Politik war Konrad Adenauer, ein erzreaktionärer, konservativer Politiker, der sie übrigens selber das Abkommen mit Israel antisemitisch begründet hat. Adenauer was the first Chancellor of West Germany after the war. His cabinet and ministries notably employed a considerable number of ex-Nazis, along with one of his closest confidants, Hans Globke, the responsible ministry official for Hitler's anti-Jewish racial legislation. Adenauer justified Germany's financial compensations to Israel with arguments implying the Jewish community might want revenge from the Holocaust. Konrad Adenauer said, it used his relationship with Israel in order to gain readmittance into human civilization in a way. For Ben-Gurion, that was very important to have a Western power saying, yes, the state of Israel represents all the Jews. Um, and then, of course, that relationship between these two countries uh, developed over the years. For Germany, it continues until today to be a kind of symbol. The criticism of the state of Israel is a criticism of a, not the Jewish people. It's mainly a criticism of an entity which is an apartheid entity, an occupation power entity, an entity that is violating war crimes. They want us to accept uh, surrender and to accept uh, apartheid as a solution. The bigger picture is that through BDS, the Palestinians have actually been successful in changing the Israeli propaganda machine. And instead of uh, arresting tens of thousands of Palestinians uh, every, every year, the Israeli government is now arresting thousands. Instead of killing thousands, they're killing hundreds. The whole thing about uh, the, the right of the existence of the state of Israel. I mean, give me a break. No state, no state in this whole world has a right to exist. This is not written anywhere. People have the right to exist. Human beings have the right to exist. Yeah. As Israelis, as Palestinians, as whatever. 